Hello. Angry, it's Dennis from the Australian Rock Show. How are you, mate? I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Now, we've been wanting to get you on the show and to talk some rock and roll for some time, and it's an upcoming five-week run of dates with a hard-on starting late March, which has enabled us to do so. Now, in terms of touring, there's also the Monsters of Rock Cruise next month and another European jaunt in July and August. Mate, this year is already looking just as hectic as the past couple of years. It's great to see the band in high demand. Followed, I wanted to add. Yep. Um, By later on in the year, of course, we're going around with the Screaming Jets. I didn't know that. Has that been announced yet? Ah, uh, well, I'm telling you. <laughs> I've got an exclusive. Mm, possibly. And I may have let the cat, the cat out of the bag, but that's all right. <laughs> and there's also a gig on at the Bridge in Sydney, February 15th with Palace of the King, which I also need to mention. Now, there's a whole bunch of great bands performing on that cruise, which departs Miami on February 24th, one of which are the Mighty Saxon, an outfit who you've got some history with off the top of my head. I know you both played Reading in 81 and in 2007. Yourself, along with Lemmy, recorded on the Saxon track, I've Got a Rock to Stay Alive. How did that pairing all come about? Yeah, um, when you, you see, that's someone else's. That's, I won't dispute the, the fact that it, it may be a Saxon uh, you know, uh, project, but it was Lemmy. Um, that asked me to be involved. Um, I, I've had a I've had a, a, a great relationship with uh, well, uh, God rest his soul. Um, I've had a great relationship with with Lemmy since the very very early days mm. when we first went to England in in 1980. I remember one of the one of the first real rock stars or rock people that we met um, was Lemmy and his band. Um, and in those days, it was the um, No Sleep, the Hammersmith lineup. So mm. it was Fast Eddie and, and, and I I'm still think Filthy all was playing drums. He but, was, um, yeah. We were at, we were at um, a club where musos used to hang out called Dingwalls. And we were taken there by um, for maybe it was the guys from ACDC, maybe it was... There was a collection of bands there that night, and um, I remember Diggers coming up to me and say, and said, um, you know, you wanted to meet Lemmy. I went, yeah, and he said, well, he's over at the bar. So we all went, we all went across and introduced ourselves, and um, uh, he gave me a, a, a – a, well, he, he had a, had a, a bag uh, of, of speed in his uh, – secreted in his, like, denim jacket on the inside pocket – with a straw in it held in there by an elastic band. Mm. And he just said, yeah, have a go at this. And so I had a bit of a snort and we talked for about 19 hours. Um, um, that might be in a bit of an exaggeration, but we did. We, we And we sort of talked about a lot of shit that night and became sort of acquainted. Uh, and then years later, of course, we, um, we started playing gigs with them both there and here. And that, that relationship continued right until – the last gig that we played with them here in Australia. And I remember, um, it's a poignant moment now, but um, I remember asking him about, because he looked really, really healthy and he put on a bit of chub and, and I said, you know, um, you're looking great. I mean, he said, yeah, yeah. He said, tell me who. He said, um, getting off the grog's a fucking good thing. And I said, yeah. Because, um, you know, I mean, we both took a drink, but mm-hmm. we, we, we weren't sort of, you know, dependent on it like we were in the early days. And um, I said, how's your health? I said, I heard there was a bit of a scare. He said, oh, no, it was nothing. You know, it was fucking blah, blah, blah. And he said, no, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in, you know, I'm in great health. I'm in, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he said, I've got, he said, my girl, it's like, you know, he's got me on a good diet and all that kind of shit. And some months later, of course, he passed away. So the history so dates back. Sad. But yeah. anyway, I, I remember, anyway, getting back to the song, it was he. Um, um, it, we'd done some gigs, and we ha- we had done it, it pretty much. Uh, we would always always do gigs with Saxon, whether at the big festivals or even clubs. Um, some of the bigger clubs would buy sort of like you know they'd put on like a mini festival, sort of so to speak, and there'd be like two thousand people there inside and. Um, there might be, you know, like there might be 
like sacks on top of the bill us and then an opening act, you mm. know, of some note over there. But um, yeah, we were, we says we shared management. Um, uh, Thomas Jensen, whose company runs Wacken, managed uh, Saxon. We have managed Saxon for many years, and um, and also manage us in Europe. And um, so, you know, we 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 did do. And I remember, um, I remember um, talking to Lemmy on the phone, and he said, "Look, we've got this thing going where." There's several of us going to record a vocal over the same song. And um, would you come down and throw a vocal on it? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, they were in some sort of little country town somewhere at a recording studio. So they flew me down there and or, I think I was I think I was on a train, I think, maybe. And, um, yeah, it was a little country town. Uh, someone's studio and went in there and, you know, we all had a, a good time. We had a great time doing the vocal. I think there was one other, I think there was one other singer. If memory serves me correctly, mm. there was four singers and, and I can't remember who the fourth one was for the life of me. But, um, Rose Tats and then they wanted to. The Tats and Saxon were, of course, label mates on the French label Carrera as well, Correct. Oh, gee, with that, that's going back historically. That was going back a long way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that way, way back early, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so um, the association was, you know, but that's the way I remember it. I remember that there was, it, we just went in and, you know, it was one of those sort of boozy nights where we all had a lot of laughs and, you know, we're drinking um, bourbon and beer and, mm. um, and we had a great time. Well, not- and, and they they actually they wanted to while we were there for the next couple of years they were always trying to marry up the three bands on a bill mm. which never happened so that with three of us could because in the end it was released with only the three vocals the three vocalists and um, mm. they were always trying to marry up the band the three bands to play on the same gig at the same time so that we could all get up and sing the song. Mm. Never happened. Never happened. Well, I note that uh, Pat Travers is also performing on that cruise I mentioned, a guy who, along with yes. Aaron, along with Aerosmith, you toured the US with back in 82. Did you strike a rapport with, yes. with, with, with either of those outfits back then? You have done your homework. Pat Travers, we got to know quite well because we did a lot of, a lot of the smaller gigs, like when we were... Um, when we weren't doing the big nights mm. with the big boys, because um, uh, Pat Travis Band and us were on the same bill. Mm. Yeah, so the, the nights where the big the big boys would take a night off, which was about every sort of like third or fourth night, they were you know they do like we do two or three shows in a row and then have a, a night or two off. Um, Pat Travis and, and 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 the Tats would, it, as all likelihood, go and do a club date together. Mm. So yeah, we we um we spent a bit of time in their company and um and and did genuinely love the band. I mean, Pete was Pete was quite um I remember you know enamoured of of the band. He he really liked them um, and I, and I grew to. But I didn't know an awful lot about them. I'd heard about them obviously and heard some of their stuff. But um yeah um we formed a, a really good working relationship during the in fact there was some pretty wild nights uh-huh. <laughs> i recall good stuff now mate at the end of this episode i will run through all the band's upcoming gig dates including the aforementioned runner shows with the hard-ons uh on the still never too loud tour but coincidentally never too loud is the song we kicked off this show with can you fill us in on the background of that track um as i recall um, it's a Geordie Leach. That's song. right. It's a B side, isn't it? From the yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And um, eighty four, something like that. Geordie, Geordie, because um, not a lot of people know that because um, the first album was divided equally five ways. But um, our signature song, which is I remember Pete saying in the early early days. Um, 
we need a song that actually defines the band. And this was this was around about the time that um, we were doing demos, and uh, George and Harry really liked the vibe of Bad Boy. And this was pre the signature riff, which Mick came up with. The da 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 da. Mm-hmm. That was because before then it was just the da 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 da, like a lot of Ian Ryland songs, like just like a you know a Chuck Berry sort of a chord thing. And um, yeah, and it was Mick that came up with the signature riff, and then it became, and then they got very very excited about it and said, look, you know, this is you know we found a single, and Pete Pete wanted to. Uh, to us to write a song that clearly identified the band. Um, and this is how visionary and how forward thinking, um, uh, prophetic even maybe he, he was. Um, so I came up with this lyric, rock and roll outlaw. And, um, you know, because we didn't want to be known as bad boys, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, we wanted to be known as rock and roll outlaws. So, it, well, well that, you know, hence the lyric of the song. Um, and he said, yeah, yeah, that's more like it. And, and we were looking for a tune and, and Geordie came in one day and and just, you know, started playing on guitar, like trying to, you know, get get his fingers around playing um, the, the rock and roll outlaw sort of thing. And, and um, again, Mick stepped in and gave it the signature rhythmic part, you know, which is why, the, you know, like, dun, 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 but getting back to Never Too Loud, he, he came to me once and he said, look, I've just got this thing. It's just like a, it's a full on rocker. And he played um, Never Too Loud. And I said, well, you know, we grabbed a bit of it on tape and I took it away. And um, and it was just like the Outlaw. Outlaw was basically written like in, within a matter of hours, like, uh, you know, because it had to be, you know, mm. it was like need, needed. And, and so we... We knocked it together, but it was Geordie's riff, um, which is why he has the notes of the main refrain uh, tattooed on his the inner part of his forearm. Hmm. He, he's got um, you know like sheet music, so to speak, you know, like um, and it's it's got the the notes of of rock and roll outlaw. He's got that tattooed on the inside of one of his forearms, but um, never too loud. I just sort of thought, you know, I love the. You know, the belligerence, like, you know, the, of the drive of, you know, of just the simple, you know, because it related back to to Rylands and how he would just take a simple chord, you know, and, and like ACDC, like the Stones, like everybody, take a simple chord pattern, you know, trading off Chuck Berry. And um, and, and it, it was down to having just, you know, like a hooky lyric and a melody, you know, so... Well, I reckon... You know, I, I thought, I reckon... yeah... With lyrics like um, it's never too loud and it's never too strong, the banner of a working class man, it's never too late, it's never out of date, uh, it's still very much a hard hitting and to the point message and for many of us words which still ring true today. Yeah, I um, uh, won't go into, um, uh, you know, like when I, when I say the politics of it, I mean, it's, you know, unfortunately... Um, it wasn't written, and I, and I understand what you're saying uh, about the because you know uh, that's the background I come from. Mm-hmm. Um, now, now, my my political view may have changed, but the essence of those words still rings true today. I think the politics around the essence of that lyric, um, uh, unfortunately, this is just purely my view. Um, but you know they've, they've changed quite considerably, if not drastically. Um, and in my personal view, which is my personal view, and it's um, not something that I want to expound in necessarily in public. But um, I, I think a lot of people uh, would listen to the song now and say, "Well, um, you know, 
is it is it just as true for me? In other words, like you know, they might pose the question to me: Is that lyric just as true for you today as it was then? Mm. Well, the simplistic answer is yes, mm. um, because um, it transcends politics. It's not it's not a song with a political bias or view. It's about it's more about it's, it's a, like a character thing. It's like it's more about the working class man is, is something that doesn't belong to uh, one political persuasion or another. Mm. The working class man is the man who works. Uh, hence, uh, you know, uh, the designation, if you like, or the identification of you know the working class man. So, what does that what does that actually mean? Well. I was brought up as in a urban suburban um, uh, you know city dwelling working class man okay so um, by way of and I don't know if this illustrates the point well enough but um, a lot of my nan's family my nana's family uh, worked on the land and a lot of people don't tend to think they think oh working class it's all about um, you know, working in factories and that kind of thing. So working class man. But working class is, is, is the people who actually work. So, um, and, and I, I learned at a very, very early age because of my, my associate, you know, I used to go and have my school holidays uh, with my rellos that worked the land. And, um, you know, you have to, and I learned, very, very early on in, in the piece that um, some of the hardest working people in the country uh, don't work in factories. Mm, mm. They work the land because, um, and, uh, you know, they work from basically sun up to sundown, which are fairly long hours, and uh, they're self-employed, so their, their yield, if you like, or their... Um, how they manage to get by in a, in, a, in a monetary sense is directly attributed to the amount of work that they put in. So uh, if they want to do well out of life, they put in long, hard hours. And just as a kid, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't driving the tractor, but, you know, as a kid, I remember being on the tractor uh, with my Uncle Les and because um, it was very exciting to sit on a tractor while, um, you know, they cut or why they, you know, um, a, a dug, um, you know, f- plow a field or, or, or cut, um, uh, you know, grass or whatever they were cutting for feed, whatever, those sort of things. Um, driving along, uh, you know, on the tractor, holding the hose while they sprayed, um, you know, orchards, uh, all that kind of stuff I remember as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I don't take it away from anybody having worked in a factory for, for a few years, like uh, as an, an apprentice, but, um, I don't take it away from anyone that works. But what I'm saying is that that, that, that lyric is about an ethic. It's about a work ethic. It's about people who actually apply themselves to work, to make things better, not mm. just for themselves, but for. Uh, you know, in a grandioso sense, um, um, you know, the country itself. So it, it's, it's um, people, by way of just sort of offering that, I suppose, is that, you know, people have said to me that when they want to, when they want to criticise me, you know, you've forgotten, uh, you know, what you stood for. And um, I'm always amused by that because, like, okay, um what, what brings you to, to that conclusion? They go, oh well, you know, you you know, you you grew up working class, blah 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 blah, and and now you're a conservative. And they go, well, I'm still working class because mm. it's not about politics, and that's where a lot of people get it wrong. Um, it's like empathy or or compassion. They don't those things don't belong to a political party. They belong to anybody that adopts them or accepts them as the reality of you know, their life or their existence. And, mm. and, and that, that doesn't belong. And, and, and one of the things, um, which is why I, I am losing faith in, in our system as a, as a working 
living, breathing thing, um, our political system, is because uh, all of a sudden we've allowed the politics of, of division uh, to, to become more important than, you know, what either party is doing, uh, well, for the, not just for the betterment of all, all people, because I think at one stage, in a romantic sense, when I was very young, I think you could have been, you could have easily have accepted that, you know, both parties were, yeah, you know, left and right. Okay, well, there's more than that now. There's 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 other fragmentations, but you could have, I think, at one, you know, maybe an innocent, you know, naive view. But at some stage in in my life, I I was pretty sure that, you know, yeah, no, you know, I um. You know, both parties are sort of dedicated to, uh, um, you know, the betterment of, of, of all concerned. And mm -hmm. Whereas these days, whereas these days, um, I'm not so sure. Well said, mate. Let's talk, let's just change tack a little and let's talk a little about the uh, this current lineup of the Tats. And I'm going to say to you the same thing which I mentioned to Mark Evans when we had him on the show last year. I saw the band. Oh, did you? I, I saw the band on a couple of shows uh, with Hitman DTK late 2017, and in my humble opinion, not since the 1998 lineup, with the, which of course had Ian Ryland on on board, had I heard the band sounding as tough and with as, as much grunt. My question is, what do guys like Mark and Bob Spencer bring to this current lineup? Um, I think with Mark, um, there's an undeniable. I've known Mark since Phil joined ACDC. Mm. And he went from Buster into ACDC. And not long after that, Mark joined. And so we were, we were hanging around together. And um, so the association with Mark goes back a long way. Anyway, having said that, move forward all these years. Now, all those years in the interim, we kept – in contact, albeit mm. some years, um, you know, the only time I'd see him is if I'd go and see, say, um, him play with somebody. Right. Um, uh, in all honesty, I wouldn't. I don't think I would have gone out of my way, but there was a few times where I knew, um, uh, particularly, you know, because of my association with um, what do they call them now? OM. Oh, outlaw motorcycle OMCGs. Yep. Outlaw motorcycle gigs. Um, um, he and Dave Tice would be playing at someone's clubhouse, and I'd be asked to go, and and I would, you know, um, out of respect. Uh, anyway, having said that, um, you know, we kept in touch, and I kept up sort of, you know, contact with him. We've always been pals. He was very close to Mick. Um, played in a couple of bands, lineups with Mick. Um, so there was that, there was that connection as well. We have always got along, and I always thought to myself, you know, one of these days, um, you know, we'll, we'll do something together musically. I mean, mm -hmm. there was a few times when when we sort of got up with Lucy's band or Pe Lucy and Pete's band, mm -hmm. and blah blah blah. So we had the opportunity to sort of play together. And I remember once getting up with Lucy. Well, you know, what was the damn fine band, but. We were doing a, a pub gig under a different name, but it was Peter and I and Lucy and a few others, and and Mark got up and played guitar. And I thought, fuck, you know, he's, he's, he's a good rhythm player. But then again, he's he's got that rhythmic thing. Mm, mm. So I think I think in a real strong sense, what he brings to um, um, what he brings to is a, I, I suppose in a sense um, is authenticity too big a word. No, no, that um, suits. Um, because of his, not just because of his ACDC credential, because, I mean, let's face it, it was because the boys in ACDC, because of the, um, the um, it's like, it was like Mark says, and he may have even said um, uh, to you um, that ACDC's favourite band was Rose Tats, as was Rose Tats' favourite band was um, ACDC. Mm, mm. So it, it, there was there was always this uh, mutual, um, you know, love affair going on, <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> for want of a better word. Um, yeah, it's just, um, 
I thought when you know we're choosing um, Mark, there was very few. I mean, when you've had someone like Geordie Leach in the band, where do you go from there? Um, I mean, Rylands was a you know a, an amazing um, uh, innovator when it came to to playing bass. Um, 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 and I often told the story. I mean, if it hadn't have been for Rylands, um, we wouldn't have found um, Mick Cox because Mick, until he joined the Tats as a stand-in, until we found another guitar player. Um, he learned to play guitar, that amazing machine gun chopping mm, rhythmic mm. sort of right hand of his. And he's known for having, you know, one of the great right hands of, of history. Um, he he learned that or he adopted that to, to compliment because Rylands played all downstrokes mm. on the bass. Because he loved that, but instead of playing it staccato, well, that's maybe not the right word, but with no rhythm, Ian, because he was such a, a wonderful blues player, he was able to put into downstrokes. There was rhythm in it, so that's why the early tats just swung like a fucking mm. dunny door at a butcher's picnic, you know, because. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It was just fucking, and and he he taught Mick, so to speak, to play guitar like that, and that's how that unmistakable rhythmic section now that which cannot ever be duplicated, um, uh, you know, is 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 the is the sound of the early Rose Tats, and so you don't set out to like. You know, pulling Guy into the band, you don't set out to replicate Peter Wells because you can't do it. So don't even, you know, like, don't fall into this fucking huge hole, gaping hole in the ground by trying to sort of, you know, replicate in a slide player Pete Wells. What you do is you look for someone who is completely different so that there's an authenticity to whatever we do from that moment on because it belongs to us. Um, so you don't try and replicate Mick Cox or Robin Riley. But Robin was never a, um, a, a rhythm player per se, but he had a gr- he's got a great right hand, so he was a great rhythm player. Whereas Mick was always the rhythm player. Mm, mm. Um, unmistakably, he was the foil, if you like, or he was the you know he was the thing that that supported him and him and whatever bass player and the drummer. We always had a three part rhythm section which supported the the two instruments out the front which is pete slide and my my vocals but um so picking i'd always wanted to i always wanted to work with with um with mark and i thought you know what i just want that that thing that he's got that melbourne that melbourne sort of you know, DNA belligerent sort of, and it, it's just got this beautiful, simple drive. And I said, because I didn't, you know, I just knew I couldn't get a busy, you know, not that Geordie was ever busy, but he was always very tasteful. And he knew when to plod and drive and he knew when to inflect and add something, you know, quite wonderfully musical. But, the guitar player I had in mind was, apart from Bob, um, um, Bob was first choice because I knew that Bob Bob had a rhythm style that was not – and he – one of the great things about Bob is that he said, you know what, I'm going to try and capture the essence of Mick without trying to play like Mick because mm. he said, no one can, no one can. So in the way that he's adapted Mick's parts, I think he's, he's gone a long way to, to capturing the essence and the excitement of Mick's playing, but it's definitely Bobby Spencer. And it, I think that's an amazing thing. And it's something I, I could not have, I mean, when you say hope for, I knew that, I knew that Bobby would bring something quite unique because I've known Bobby since he was 17, um, uh, since he was playing with Finch, and I remember seeing him playing with Finch when I was in Buster, when and uh, when we first came up here, and that was you know uh, 
um, Phil was still in the band then, so we were sort of at our best. And we played checkers uh, one night and Finch were on. And fucking Bobby Spencer just blew me away because, you know, I've, I've always been a, a cos-off nut, like a free, you know, free, one of my favourite bands. And um, so I loved what he I loved what he did. And we've, we've been friends ever since. In fact, he, he introduced me to my future wife, um, mother of the children. But that's, a, that's another story. I've forgiven him for that, um, <laughs> which is... <laughs> well, oh, it just... But, um, with, with Mark, I know that um, he he brought something a different dimension when he uh, he plugged in with with TMG a couple of years ago, and he just looks right at home in tattoo. And uh, yes, he, he does. That's I can't sum it up any better than that. He he just looks right at home, like he's he's meant to be there. He said after being in ACDC, and he'll tell you this himself. He may have already told it, seeing as you've spoken to him. Uh, the only other band band that he's ever wanted to be in is in now. He did. He said that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, can I? Um, I, I know that I got a tough one for you. Hard to believe that in March it will be 13 years since Pete passed away. And I guess that for so many years, you know, you'd look over stage right, and there he was. Initially, how difficult was it for you to carry on performing without him? And I ask that because you know, at the very beginning, you, Pete, and also Ian, uh, you know, were a, a pretty tight trio, weren't you? Yeah. Um, yes, we were. Uh, in fact, all our differences aside, and uh, this will come out in the book uh, if it's ever written, um, there were huge differences. I mean, you had two Leos, Ian and I, and two Capricorns, the two guitar players. I think, oh, Jesus, I don't know to tell you the truth, but I think, Digger was like Aries or something like that. Um, very gentle soul, but you know, like immensely talented. But just a, just one of those fragile, gentle souls. Um, which is why, uh, you know, I mean, he he made some bad choices in his life, and um, as we all do, um, and of course, inevitably, it um, it. Um, I think it contributed heavily to his uh, early demise and that because we were in the throes of putting the band back together again when he when he died of cancer. But having said that, um, so even though there was there was great there was real real um, real passionate um, uh, personality clashes within the band, but I think the thing, you know, in the wonderful romantic sense, what we all realised in the early, early days, the very early days, was like uh, it was like throwing petrol on fire. I mm -hmm. mean, the two things should the, the two things should never be put together, but when they do, when you put petrol on fire, it produces something fucking incredibly like fantastic that burns really immensely fierce for a brief short of you know amount of time, and then you have to replenish it. And that's the way I, I've described uh, it. It was a, a really volatile relationship. But in hindsight now, um, you know, obviously very um, a very productive relationship. The self-titled Rose Tattoo album celebrated its 40th anniversary late last year. It's one which I consider to be the, the ultimate rock and roll record, and I would stack it up against any other release ever. Murray Engelhart summed it up. I know Murray summed it up perfectly in his Blood, Sweat and Beers publication with the line, it was and remains a swaggering rock and roll masterpiece. Now, in my opinion, it can sit alongside any of those classic records from Zepp, Aerosmith, The Stones. I read that this current lineup were going to re-record it. Is that correct? Yep. What's the out thinking of, behind out it? Of, it's, it's it, to mark a milestone, but it's to complete, in a sense, a cycle, mm. um, knowing that, you know, like, because life is like a spring. It, it doesn't meet where it started. It spirals circularly through time. And I think, I, I love the idea, it, it, we were trying to think of something that we could do that would acknowledge and pay homage and honour the legacy, if you like, and I'm very grateful for what you've said about that album. Um, to, 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 pay, to, to, to mark its 40th anniversary and the fact that 40 years later, and I remember Pete saying in the early days, 
if people are still singing our songs in 20 years, we know we've got it right. And 40 years down the track and possibly in, you know, 60 years, like in 20 years hence from here, people will still be, like there's young bands in Europe and there's a couple of young bands that have sent me stuff from uh, America and they not only took, They've taken, and you can hear the influences these days. I mean, you couldn't hear the influences of Rose Tattoo in Guns N' Roses, but of course they readily acknowledge the influence that we played or have had on, on them. Mm. But you can actually, there's bands now that have sent me stuff that where they cover Rose Tattoo stuff, but in in other in their originals, sort of the other songs on their albums, you can hear from now, every now and again. You can hear the influences, and you just think to yourself, like, you know, that's that's a, 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 an amazing legacy to have because it's 40 years since, you know, 78 uh, um, when the first one was recorded, and um, we just thought, I just thought it would be, uh, you know, a way of acknowledge because the boys in the band are so respectful of, of, of what they are, now a part of they they've accepted the fact that they are now um you know because bobby even said to me and i think mark might have even told you bobby even said to me he said like what what made you think of me and i said because it was it's um it's it's in keeping with the tradition of rose tattoo it's listen can i just take this this is a call. For, I need to take this, please. Go for it, mate. Go for it. Thanks, mate. Yeah, you there? Oh, sorry, mate. I was there. That's okay. Look, I had some uh, had some lovely peaceful it music, was... <laughs> and it, uh, it reminded no. me actually. <laughs> now, go ahead. Yeah, go on. No, it reminded me. Uh, I was going to ask you about Ian Ryland, and, and he wrote a track called uh, Rosetta years ago, which I think is beautiful, and that uh, that music on the. Well, let me just. Correct you on that, just for a piece of trivia, right? So this will yep. the Ian Ian came to me um, very early on in the piece. I mean, we wrote quite a few songs where we collaborated um, on lyric, um, and uh, I'm not going to go into uh, all of it because it's it's it, 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 it would sort of degenerate into sounding like possibly um, uh, nitpicking, but um, I, I contributed to several songs uh, in the early days um, where he, he would have a verse and a chorus hmm. and he would say, um, it, I, I think if you went back and analysed, like, like say, a, a shrink or somebody, you know, like, you know how sometimes when they're in past cases, they've gone, um, it, it, when people are, uh, are, you know, being taken to court for plagiarising or whatever, they've been able, a, able to analyse where somebody else has written something into something because it doesn't seem to gel with the other part. Like, And they're able to analyse um, certain parts of, of you know great works, uh, you know plays, songs, whatever. Mm. Um, so I don't know whether that could happen in this case, but I know that I contributed lyrically to several uh, uh, to several songs. Which when when he decided that he was going to uh, go off on his own, um, he sat down and talked to uh, to George and Harry, and 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 I was involved. Pete and I were involved as well, uh, to, you know, to a lesser degree. And and we agreed, or it was agreed, uh, publishing wise, that um, certain songs uh, would be given over to him. Um, Astro Wally is one in point. Um, mm. I, I know that Astro Wally, he worked on that with um, with Nick, um, and so uh, Astro Wally, I think, on the on the original album is, is, is Ryland's and Ben. I'm not too sure if he's, he's, he's in on that. It, it might've been traded off, but, um, and I don't know why Rosetta got, um, 
Uh, I don't know why it ended up being a Ryland song because it was definitely a song that he and I worked, worked on together. Um, it's interesting. I'm, I'm learning. It, it's good to, it's good to yeah, yeah. hear these well, stories, it, you know. It's, it's it's just one of those things. I'm like I'm, I'm neither here nor there about it, but um, it, you know, when I think about it, I think you know, like, well, um, it, it would have been nice to have been credited credited uh, with being, you know, uh, uh, just as you know, part of the lyric. But um, mm. and and I suppose the reason that you mentioned that is because we're going to um, we're going to include that on the re-recording. There's there's three songs that are going to be included on the re-recording, which are all Ryland's songs. One's called Sweet Love Rock and Roll, one's called um, Snow Queen, and the other one is Rosetta. There's piano right at the very end of Rosetta from memory, which is quite striking and unexpected. Um, I'd love to hear that version. Um, that quite possibly could have been Piggy, or it quite possibly could have been um, George. Before I drift too far away from this this time period, we're going to close out this particular show with a hard driving gypsy in my soul. So, whilst we're oh. on that story, goes that Lobby had been in the UK for two years and uh, had the stint in LA. Returns to Melbourne, forms a three piece which includes Gil Matthews and Gavin Carroll. Does a, a national tour. Uh, Double J records the gig live to air at Manly, but when the album was being mixed, the vocals were not usable, so he gets Ewan Mandu, the singer from his outfit, Southern Electric, to head into the studio to re-record the vocals. Have I got all that correct? Pretty much. The, the, when he first approached us, um, uh, Mandu had, had... I'd seen him sing with um, the, the orchestra, so to speak, um, on a couple of different occasions, and I get up and sing some rock and roll stuff, like, you know, um, Roll Over Beethoven, Johnny Be Good, you know, whatever, like Chuck Berry stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, so when it came to do the live with dubs, um, the dubs he's talking about were the vocals, mm-hmm. and uh, you're quite right about that. Um, and what he wanted to do um, after I did... I don't know that he didn't like uh, if Mandu cut a vocal on Gypsy, but he he said to me, he said, I want you to come and sing Gypsy. He said, because I just hear that sort of delivery, that the, the sound of my voice, the, you know, the, the that sort of like, for want of a better word, that Roddy Stewart-y sort of um, character about it. He said, because it's, 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 it's not as you know because um, the other the other vocals are be- you know quite lovely and beautiful. I, I think in some cases uh, mm-hmm. with, with the melodic um, thing that he had, he had a. Um, so anyway, we went in and did it, and and, um, uh, and then uh, then what happened was we were going to record another album um, when it was written, but um, so we went out and we did a bunch of gigs. And um, they would do, they would do a set, and uh, and then I would do like part of a set before, and I'd do covers, and um, yeah, and it was it was the prelude, if you like, for when um, for later, you know, like for for lobby and my relationship, as far as just like there was one incarnation of the balls. It wasn't called the coloured balls; it was just called balls. Mm. And it was it was Lobby and and, uh, and Midlands, um, uh, Bob Z, um, the Digger and I. Wow. Yeah, and we played. We started playing around Melbourne, um, and it was just called Balls. Lobby had a, an album in mind, um, oh. you know, blah blah blah, lots of plans that never eventuated. But Lee, of course, later on, of course, he played. He came up and played bass with the Tats, which was. Another story altogether. <laughs> I often wonder what would have happened with Lobby's career if Richard Branson uh, had it given him some backing. Apparently, when he'd heard uh, Lobby's Obsecration album, he wanted to release it on Virgin. I guess that will always remain a mystery. But while I got you about that time period, I read a comment uh, mm. online from um, Buster Brown guitarist John Moon, which I wish to run mm. past you. He said, unfortunately, mm. 
As is the case for most bands, vinyl didn't really capture what the band was like live. We were a lot more aggressive live. I've always thought that Rose Tattoo was the grown-up version of Buster, and that is pretty much what we aspired to, but with the addition of keyboards. Fairly assess- mm. fairly accurate assessment, you think? I don't think you could find a better one. I think um, uh, one of the things that... Um, I, I didn't remember this until I read something about uh, in a book uh, written about Sunbury um, and it alluded to the fact and it is a fact um, and I didn't remember it I had no recollection Buster Brown was one of the few bands that ever got an encore okay. and we, we yeah and you can read that and you can read it in the book it's there as a quote one of the few bands to get an encore at Sunbury was Buster Brown the band was very much a real. It was it was modelled once I joined, um, and still to this day I want to do this as a as 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 a project, if you like. Before my days are done, mm. I want to do my my favourite rock and roll band of all time is the Faces, and the Tats were very very much uh, the Tats. Uh, Buster was very very much modelled around that. I tried to bring as much of an influence. In fact, we used to do a song called Borstal Boys in um, – we did a few other Rod Stewart songs too, like Stay With Me and um, – uh, Love, Love Borstal Boys. You know, it's, uh, it's it still sounds Borstal phenomenal. Borstal Boys, today. Yep. it's a fucking mighty rock and roll it track. It is, it is. And it's just one of the most – you know, and it, it is when you think of Borstal Boys, you think of one of the boys. You think of Buster Brown. Mm. You know, you see him walking down every street in every, in every town. Blah blah blah. You know that whole boys song thing, which has served the Tats very well, but it started with Buster. And 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 Mooney's Luna, as you know, of course that's his nickname, Luna. Mm. Um, uh, it's um, it's one of those things that um. Yeah, I, I don't know where you saw that, but that's, you know, it doesn't surprise me that um, Luna would come out with that because um, Luna was, uh, we had a couple of intellects in the band, um, uh, certainly not me and and, um, and Phil, but um, <laughs> uh, or even Geordie, who, who'd, who'd not yet become the thinking man's bass player, but... <laughs> Um, Darky Wilson, Chris Wilson, the keyboard player, and um, and, um, and 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 Luna were definitely, um, uh, you know, more than just sort of like rock players, as in the sense they they had a vision. Um, hence the, you know, like when you listen to the arrangement now in Buster, you think, oh Jesus, how many parts can it have? But it was it was Darky's obsession with sort of like. Um, you know, yes, and all those kind of, you know, like concept, uh, musically structural bands. Uh, and it was his way of trying to, um, not that it was a snobby thing, don't get me wrong, but trying to, to, to you know, like the thing, the thing of the day was that there was a lot of musicality going on um, with a lot of the bands that were doing things sort of like excitingly in music, right? But so... None of us envisaged um, uh, Buster as being like yes, but there were elements of yes about you know the the, the soaring, the grandioso part of, of some of their arrangements and, and their instrumentation, um, uh, coupled with you know, and they had you know extremely um, you know melodic vocals and you know beautiful notes being sung by beautiful singers, whereas we had this you know this raspy blues singer and and and. And a very sophisticated musical lineup. And um, when I say sophisticated, I mean in the sense of like Matt Lake and mm-hmm. um, uh, you know um, uh, what was there, Sebastian Hardy and other other bands around at the time that were you know Airs Rock. I mean, fuck me, you know. I mean, I, you, know <laughs> you know, I used to go and see you know because I loved Airs Rock because I loved all the blokes. We, yeah. we were mates, yeah. but I'd go and watch them play, and I just sort of wet myself how good they were. I mean. Mm. Um, air, aerial, Mertz of Spectrum, you know, whatever you like to call them. They fucking, you know, just were amazing to watch but to listen to. You know, they had this fucking amazing thing going on. But anyway, uh, long story short, I waffle. Sorry. 
Um, yeah, uh, Luna has summed it up beautifully, and and you can tell if you if you close your eyes. I mean, um, you know, uh, some some of the beautiful things on a you know like Dear Lady and um, uh, a couple of other songs on on Buster. You know, you can really tell the, the faces thing, but we had a real hard edge, which never was. I don't know what the thinking was, and this is no criticism of Lobby, but we worked on a shoestring budget because the whole budget went to three other bands, predominantly the Skyhooks. Um, but, you know, like, I think we produced that album for like somewhere between five and six grand or some ridiculous amount of money. And and we recorded it pretty much over a couple of nights and we recorded it pretty much live because there mm. was very little budget for any, any sort of like production or sort of value or whatever. So, and, and and it never got close. But I mean, when you think of a song like Something to Say, um, one of the, and this is, you know, this is a bit of trivia for you, you don't notice until you actually listen to the song. But when they did the bed track, it was so late at night Everyone was tired. They left a passage, like all the verses are like fours or eights, right? Four lines or eight lines. The last, the last verse is missing a line. It's missing a line because the bed track was recorded. They went home. I did the vocal. And we came to the end and it ran out. I said, wait a minute, there's not enough room for the last line. And... Lobby, and I, I can't remember the guy that was producing it, said, well, you'll just have to drop a line. So there's a missing line out of something to say on that album. And it's, I, look, I look at the, the, my lyric book and there it is. So the next time we get to record that song, it'll have the fucking extra line in it. I had, um, I had Phil lined up for an interview last year, which fell through right at the last, very last moment. But I was going to suggest to him that he should include something to say you know, in his set list when he was doing his solo thing. But um, before I move on from Buster Brown, I once read that Phil had a rehearsal with the Tats around 83. Is that true or false? Yes. He did? No, it's true. Okay. How did that come about? Um, it was because he was no longer in ACDC. He wanted to find him to do something. And he came down, had a rehearsal, and he just said, um, you know, I'm not ready. Okay. And um, and it, it never eventuated. I have seen you many times over the years. I wish to mention a couple of dates, if you can recall, I'd like your thoughts on. Now, one is from 1988. Saw you in a lineup yep. with Mark Hunter and Sharon O'Neill called The Good, The Bad and The Angry. For memory, uh, Coxie was also in the band. Looking back at that time yep. period where you also did some dates with the Party Boys and, of course, you had found yep. solo success with Suddenly, were you content with how things were progressing back then and did you in any way miss not being in Rose Tattoo? Um, whenever I wasn't in a Tats lineup, um, I always missed it. But um, by that stage, I'd, I'd learnt by the hard road of um, experience that um, the volatility uh, attached to uh, the Tats was um, uh, well. I, I think it was. I think it was fairly obvious to those close to the band. And, and it certainly was becoming, there was a, uh, an instability, if you like, um, uh, th that was um, becoming known by most people who follow the band, mm. uh, that band seemed to not be able to maintain over a long period of time uh, any one lineup. Now, having said that, that's, uh, that's always been a truism of the band, um, I don't think, in all fairness, that this lineup is going to suffer the same fate. But uh, you never know. It, uh, there may be uh, extenuating circumstances, um, you know, uh, family stuff, health stuff, uh, whatever. So, you know, it may be that um, uh, this lineup might change um, uh, in the foreseeable future because of, you know, extra sort of like extraordinary um, uh, situational conditions, if you like. Mm. But I'd, I'd accepted um, by, um, uh, you know, particularly after America. Um, I, I think the American thing was a, a real eye opener. Um, it, it gave us uh, a, a very, very clear indication that 
if we wanted it in, in wanted in inverted commas, if we wanted it badly enough, and it would have required, as it does, uh, total stability. If we wanted it bad enough, um, American success, acceptance, success, um, which which leads into, I mean, let's face it, um, worldwide in in a lot of cases. I mean, it worked for ACDC in excess, blah blah blah. Um, a few notables that um, don't fit into that, but um, um, it, it was just one of those things that I think the opportunity was there. The, the Americans said, um, you know, the, the record company, because, you know, they're run by a very conservative people. Uh, even to this day, I think um, most major record companies have always been run by very conservative thinking people because, uh, you know, they're, they're answerable to uh, bean counters, etc. So there's a, there's a real reason why that happens. But having said that, um, so there was the pressures of like, well, okay, you guys are going to be on the road in America for the next three, four, five years possibly, but a uh, record company said at least three years. Um, and that would almost guarantee because they were, uh, you know, really, really, um, really impressed with what the band was. So, I mean, there was a, there was a few... Um, I, I know Peter took those as criticisms, um, but they were advice in, in another form, another guise, so to speak, from the record company that, you know, you, possibly, you know, in fitting with the, uh, with the nature of the band, you could probably, you know, uh, you know include some acoustic numbers, um, um, as quirky as Stuck On You uh, is, was, um, they liked the quirkiness of it. They said, like, I remember one record exec sort of saying, you know, could you come up with something a bit more like, like stuck on you? Cause it's, you know, such a, an acceptable little thing. And, you know, maybe, you know, blah, blah, blah. They, they wanted to make changes. So, you know, Peter was, uh, he, he announced towards the end of, uh, of that, um, our second, uh, American tour that he wouldn't be continuing with the band. So, Faced with that, the reality of that, even the dangling in front of us, the, um, you know, like the success, if you like, or the acceptance of the American audience, would have, which would have led, if it had come about, it would have led to uh, us all being sort of financially secure, mm. you know, in all, in all likelihood for the, for the rest of our lives. But the, the point I'm trying to illustrate that was that during the band's um, history, uh, there has been several of those moments when, uh, you know, the band was poised, uh, if you like, um, for, for that real crossover success. Not that we ever sought it. And this is the same, the, the, the strange thing for me in reflection was that I realised now um, we weren't asked to compromise ourselves uh, to any great degree. So what I put it down to, the instability, is the volatility, and I've always said that because... Uh, in, in, in calm and measured thought since those days, reflection, if you like, hindsight being the great luxury that it is, um, it was just the volatility of the people in, involved. And, and um, so when the band, you know, the lineup, any particular lineup, I mean, I don't think that, you know, like a, the original lineup was wildly successful, but, uh, you know, doomed from the very, very beginning in hindsight. Mm, mm. Um, uh, for, for you know uh, reasons which will be revealed in their fullest, I think if if, if and if and and or when someone gets around to writing the book. Having said that, um, uh, what, to answer your question, I I had become aware that the band you know always had this limited, regardless of the of the the lineup, it seemed to have this inability to sustain. As some bands, you know, uh, can sustain the same lineup year in, year out. You know, like um, there, there are bands notable that they've never changed a member. Uh, so we weren't to be one of those. But um, so I, I was, I was very accepting, is what I'm saying, of the fact that um, you know what, um, every now and again um, we are just going to, uh, you know, fall apart mm -hmm. and. Um, so I accepted that in good humour, so to speak, um, and in good grace. And I just sort of thought, well, okay, that's cool. I was romantic enough. And um, as you know, we've spoken about this before. 
I, I, I have, like most musicians, not all, but most, uh, I have a very romantic view of what we do and the industry that we're part of, um, and that's as it should, it, it should be. Without the romance, there is no creativity. There's no, uh, you know, real um, romantic substance. There's no, without the romanticism is what I'm saying, is that there's real, no real magic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, like some music, let's face it, some music is produced purely for the, for the fact of, of, of being a sellable item. Uh, some music is actually produced methodically, mechanically. Um, you know, what's the old uh, phrase? Um, uh, music by numbers, you know, or writing songs by numbers. The people who actually sit down and go, right, uh, we've worked out the formula to write a successful single. Uh, these days, in other words, uh, what's happening these days, and they'll sit down and write uh, successful music for successful artists. But um, uh, when you listen to the music, you can tell, you know, you say, uh, this kind of sounds a bit pompous, but like there's no great passion involved. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a, a process they go through. They know how to write hit singles, so they write them. Anyway, having said that, uh, being very accepted. So the thing was, like, what do you do? Do you sit around and just mope, um, or do you do something? And and I've always thought, well, you know, I've, I've always been in a position, I suppose, as the singer. And I think you know, I'm on Pete's project of, um, you know, with the Pete Wells band, um, and he's working with Lucy, you see, he was able to create um, other music. Uh, Rylands was able to go on and form uh, X and Sardines and, uh, you know, the, I don't know, what was the name of that other band he had? Hell to uh, Pay? Nah, yeah, well, that one, but now there was another one I really liked too because um, he, he went through different phases with his songwriting too. I mean, I really loved uh, the Sardine band. Um, uh, and 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 the the, the, the lineup that I followed was the one that had Stephanie playing keyboards. Um, Stephanie was then his wife. But anyway, yeah, during those periods, I wasn't going to uh, just roll over and and go like, right, you know what, this is my whole life. There's no, I mean, that would be foolish for a start um, to, to 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 say to even believe or entertain that this is all there is um, and there's no more, there's nothing more to me than, than that. So, you know, I tried to, um, I remember when, um, I know this is kind of getting off the track a bit, but um, it's a quirky story that um, the first inkling uh, I got that I could put together a band and, and create music that wasn't strictly speaking Rose Tattoo was um, the Southern Stars Band. Mm. and But, you know, in, the, in those early days, of like, the tats had broken up. Um, uh, and, you know, I just said, well, you know, I'm going to go on as a solo artist. Um, Geordie was prepared to um, uh, to stay uh, with me. And, uh, you know, we, we proved we had a good working relationship, um, which was um, productive for both of us, etc. cetera. Um, the what happened was that uh, Albert said, "Well, look, look in, you know, in real speaking terms, we still own you, so to speak. Like I was still signed to them, um, you know, my songwriting, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And um, they said, "Look, we're we're not really, uh, we're not, you know, we signed uh, Rose Tattoo, we didn't sign Angry Anderson as a solo artist, and you know, like we might look at that further down the track where." I, I might because um, George said I had a great future in. in um, he said that I had a, a great future, um, like as a soul singer, and um, it was one of the things that he said, like you know, because you've got to plan longevity in this business. And he said, it, not yet, but he said further down the track, we'll do a similar thing that we did with you that we have done with John Paul Young, is that we'll sit down and we'll write some songs, and they'll be in that genre, that soul. Uh, you know, because um, he, he thought that, you know, that I, I was well suited to sing that sort of stuff and like do an R&B thing, you know, like, but, um, you know, cover covers, but we would write some material. Well, he and Harry would probably do the bulk of the writing. I'd write the lyrics, you know, uh, further that way. But, you know, I, I was just comfortable in just, uh, you know, doing something because I wasn't going to do nothing. Mm. 
Uh, but, you know, I was, I was fortunate along the way, too, that some of those, um, you know, those periods where we didn't work or we worked together as a lineup, you know, I, I got in a movie. Uh, you know, there, there was no band per se um, in those days. Um, and, of course, you know, in the 80s when I joined uh, television, that was just, just after uh, the band broke up in America. And it suited me because my daughter had just been born and, and I was, I had actually said to the guys, I said, you know, well, I'm happy to continue, but I don't want to live five years on the road. Neither did anybody else in the lineup, as I recall. I think Robin was probably, um, a, a Digger was kind of, you know, like one way or another. I think Robin was probably, uh, uh, maybe Geordie, I don't know, you'd have to ask Geordie, but, um, I know Peter said, look, uh, you know, there's not, you know, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life on the road in America trying to fucking bust my ass for a fucking, you know, a chance at stardom. And it suited me because I just became a father. But um, so well, I we... came home, but, you know, d- during that time, of course, I got the job in television. So and during then... those periods, I always employed myself one way or another. You know, that leads on to, uh, I guess, 1990. And from memory, I saw you mm. and your solo band, a couple of times, also one of the Aerosmith supports back then, an outfit which included uh, Robin, Bob, Bobby, Bobby Barth from Axe and Blackfoot, Jim oh, Hilburn. Jim Hilburn. Talk yeah, about that's talk that's about that's firepower. Later, yeah, gave Aerosmith a run for their money. I thought. What are your memories of that particular? Line, <laughs> that's very kind. You did um, well. The the Andy Shishon, the the album that produced suddenly we. Uh, I'd forgot when I say forgotten about it. I mean, um, uh, I don't dwell on my own memories or awful lot. I let people recall them for me. You know, I, during that lineup with the um, the Johnny Meyer, uh, Timmy Gaze, uh, Andy Shishon, um, another uh, Jake Ladeau, he came through the band at one stage. Geordie played in one of those lineups, but um, yeah, they, they were more the Angry Anderson band than they ever were Rose Tattoo. I mean. It's a, I've, and I've recounted this story to you, I know, that um, my great disappointment was that, that my first solo album, which because I signed to Mushroom as a solo artist, and they they backdoored me in a sense so that when we did the album, which was definitely, they saw the potential of having hits, so they wanted to call it Rose Tattoo. I don't know to this day why. Um, they said it was like, because it was a safe option, and I thought, well, that's, that's not what music is about. You don't take the soft, the, so, uh, the soft or the safe option. And besides, I wanted to establish myself quite firmly, and, and I proved it in the end, because when we had a hit with Suddenly, um, that you know, it, they renamed and released the album as Angry Anderson. But um, that lineup that did that album, and then only a couple of years later, we did uh, Beats, um, the, that was Beats from a Single Drum, and then we did uh, Blood from Stone, which was a, a harder-edged album. Uh, but again, you know, a, uh, and of course, that album was released as Angry Anderson. But um, produced, produced by British guitarist Mike Slamer, I think, who was in City Boy. Yeah. From memory, it copped a European release via Music for Nations, but no US deal materialised. Must have been disappointing. It was indeed. Um, I don't know exactly. I have my version. Um, I, by way of explanation, I know I wanted to reform. They wanted me to reform Rose Tattoo. When they heard the songs, they said, this is a Rose Tattoo album. Um, because the same people were in, like the first, the first uh, listening party or listening lunch we had, there was, the, there was the, some local uh, Atlantic people, and there was a couple came in from, um, I'm pretty sure from New York, I knew one of them was from New York, and they wanted to hear, they, they'd they heard that I was there doing this uh, album, and someone must have told us that like some of the tracks are sounding really good, and I remember sitting down and having a talk, and they said, do you really want to be like, is this really like you've got your heart set on roast, uh, on, on being a solo artist? And I said, well, I signed a mushroom as a solo. And, and uh, there was a mushroom representative there, a guy called Gary Ashley, by if my memory serves me well, um, who was then working in Los Angeles for Mushroom Records. And he attended the meeting and they said, have you got an idea, you know, I said, yeah. I said, I want to form a band and I want to call it Fat. 
And they said, fat. And I said, yeah, um, uh, P-H-A-T, fat. And I want Robin O'Reilly playing guitar. I said, um, we could hopefully get Geordie Lynch to play um, bass. And I said, um, you know, we might be able to get Digger because uh, he was, you know, having difficulty with, with heroin, et cetera. But anyway, having said that, and they said, and I said, the other guitar player is Leslie West. And when I said Leslie West, uh, the guys from Atlantic went, fuck, yeah. <laughs> I remember Gary Ashley said, who's the Leslie West? Which sort of <laughs> told the story about how much he knew about shit. And anyway, they said, look, what we'd really, really, our best case scenario would be that you reform Rose Tattoo and record this album as we hear it, maybe write a couple more um, couple more tunes, but, um, you know, release it as Rose, like get Rose Tattoo to record this album. And I thought, you know what? And I, I remember having a talk to Michael Slaner and I said, what do you reckon? And he said, mm, he said, like, this is your album. Really, really, really. He said, like, I don't hear Rose Tattoo here. And I said, no. I said, but have a listen to, have a listen to Southern Stars, which he sat, we sat down and had a listen to Southern Stars. And, you know, songs like Freedom's Flame and um, I Wish and um, uh, Let, Let Us Live, uh, which is, you know, which uh, when I wrote Branded, I was going to write, uh, a trilogy, if you like, uh, uh, three songs uh, in support of uh, Aboriginal people, and the first, the first was branded, and um, the second one was um, uh, Let Us Live, and then was, and then it was going to be, you know, the third one, which has not yet, as yet, eventuated. But having said that, that's a different story. I digress. So they said, look, we, we'd love you to reform Rose Tattoo and and record this album because we we think. But Rose Tattoo has already established itself as a name. Um, we can capitalise on that. You know, we can get you a major tour. They dangled all the right carrots in front of, of, of me. Um, they said, like, hey, what do you think the chances are? And I said, well, I'll ring everybody else. I'll ring everybody up and ask them, um, which is exactly uh, what I did. I rang everybody up and asked them w- what they wanted to do. And, and quite tragically, as you know, I think I told you the story. In fact, I'm pretty sure I did. Digger said yes, but he didn't know that um, by giving up heroin that um, his cancer would then be given license, if you like, to invade the rest of his body. So right. what I was told, and I, um, there was a good chance that, um, medically speaking, that uh, his cancer had been held in check by his heroin habit. And um, the fact that he was winning, because I said to him, I said, look, you know, how are you doing with the the habit and he goes, I'm on the dome. He said, I'm on the way back. And I said, well, I've got a chance to reform the band. I've written a whole album over here, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he, I remember Digger being over the moon, like absolutely like just, yeah, yeah, fucking oh, count me in, I'll get clean, you know, blah, blah, blah. And as we know, he died sometime later, not too long after that. But um, recollection-wise, I think that, I think there was a um, – um, uh, Robin uh, was was you know he was agreeable. Uh, Geordie was, and uh, I think Pete sort of had agreed to. Uh, my memory not being as great about that time as as I'd like it to be, but I think Peter basically sort of said, "Yeah, okay, maybe he thought better of it, you know, whatever." Uh, so we were very excited about forming the band. But what what broke? What broke the back of that enthusiasm, of course, was that uh, the digger died, and that sort of really, really shattered everybody. And and because you know there were, there really were, there were plans afoot, um, and plans were being made. And and but it, it was all around you know the classic American lineup, the one that you know that was it had excited Atlantic in the first place, and they were going back to you know relive that, recapture that. So. The idea of having Robin Riley, uh, Peter Wells, you know, Geordie Leach and, and Digger playing drums was, you know, just <laughs> they wetting themselves. Um, and then Digger died and, and the whole plan fell to pieces. 
On Blood From Stone, there's a track called Fire and Water, which not enough people know about. It's one of my favourite songs you've written. Starts off slow, then powers up. To be quite the, uh, quite the sing-along rock tune, that one. Um, I, I think uh, one, one of the things that um, – it's one of Jimmy Hilburn's favourites too, I might add. And we did it with um, arguably one of the best rock bands that I've ever, ever been in, certainly, which was the Jimmy Hilburn, um, Timmy Powell's – Robin and uh, and my Texan mate Bobby Bath. That was a, a that was a humongous rock band. In fact, when Michael Slamer heard the live tape off the desk that I sent him of us playing most of his our, our album, he just said, "Man, where was this fucking band when we needed to record?" And I said, "Well, you know, everyone was so enamoured of you know the LA players. The only." The only Australian that played on the whole fucking album, apart from me, was Andy. And um, and I said, well, you know, yeah. I said, you know, when we sat down and talked about the band, um, I, 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 in all honesty, I didn't have that band in mind. Um, as I said, I had, I was going to try and pair Robin Royley up with Leslie West because I knew he's one of his favourite guitar players, and he would have left at the opportunity to play in a band with Leslie, but. Um, Bobby had seen that the band lineup. in 82, correct? Sorry? Bobby had seen the band in 82, correct? Um, I was hanging around with Bobby uh, in, um, yeah, I, um, I'm pretty sure he okay. did, but he was already a big fan. And um, I was scrambling to, now that you've mentioned that, because you're better researched than I am, um, I'm, I'm scrambling to, so I was not in LA very long. Los Angeles. I hate saying LA. Um, <laughs> it sounds so Gumtree Mafia. Um, <laughs> I was not in Los Angeles very long, and Bobby Bath made contact. And I remember him saying, you know, uh, Bobby Bath, oh, that's right. When we were in, um, in, in Europe all those years ago, Bobby used to play, apart from his, old, his own band, Axe. He also played in uh, with friends of his a band called Thirty Eight Special, and I think he might have even sat in or played in with a band called um, Blackfoot. And both those bands were on a tour we did through Europe with Foreigner and Boston. It wasn't a whole tour; we did a series of dates mm. with them, and um, and I think there was a there was some sort of reference if you like to that period but yeah i wasn't there long and he he said hey what are you doing let's hang out i said yes we can I like, so we we hung out a lot and while we were writing songs he was listening to the songs and he said you know what fucking man you want to form a band like i'm fucking you know i've always been a huge stats band blah 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 i'll come and work with your band i introduced him to michael slamer we went out for meals we went out for drinks and he would when we started rehearsing the songs to to get them up so that they, when you went into the studio, they didn't feel like a singer reading lyric and singing to a backtrack. Because Michael Slayman, he said, I, you know, he said, no one paid me a great compliment. He said, no one actually delivers lyrics like, you know, vocals. Like, he said, like, the way that you just sort of get up and just sort of fucking, every time you sing the same song, you just, it's like 100% of sort of everything out on the edge. Blah, blah, blah. Very accurate. And, um, and thank you very much. And um, so uh, we used Bobby in the rehearsal band. Uh, we had a couple of drummers come in to play. We had this amazing bass player come in. He was only a young bloke, but he was playing in Frank Zappa's band, as was the drummer, one of the drummers that came in to help us rehearse. And Slamer was trying out different people to, to see who would play on the back tracks on the album. And, you know, the amazing thing, the couple of drummers that we actually talked about wanting to use were either not interested or weren't available. And to this day, and I mean, you know, a good ear can hear it, but um, he sampled all those drums with a, you know, you know, with a real, he had this really old-fashioned sampler that had real drum sounds on it. But um, he would play, he played the drums, a lot of the drums on keyboards. Hmm. And, um, and uh, I can't remember the name of the machine, but it's a legendary drum machine that, uh, that's got a keyboard and a touchpad. 
and you and and he would because you know he was a frustrated drummer, um, like a lot of guitar players are. Um, he played like a drummer, and uh, so it, that's why in some parts it actually swings. I agree with you. It, it, Jimmy Hilbert once said to me that Fire and Water, and there's a couple of other tracks on on Blood from Stone, um, like Heaven. Um, he loves that song. Um, in fact, uh, Jimmy wanted to do Heaven as the follow-up to Bound for Glory. And um, <laughs> to this day, and I'm sure I've told you this story, uh, Mushroom didn't hear it. And I'm, I'm fucked if we know why. We just thought, like, really? Um, uh, you don't hear Heaven as being a radio play song? Heaven's where I want to be. And, um, and you know the other song, which... Um, I know it sounds pompous, and I said, "Look, what about bad days?" As and a single, we yeah. Played it. Uh, well, you know, and, yeah, because it's so quirky and it's so left of centre, and I just thought it'd be really cool, from you know, to establish myself as a, as a um, you know, after suddenly to to really establish myself as a solo artist, singer songwriter in his own right, and have this really dark, broody sort of. Mystic, almost mystical sort of thing. Um, you know, well, uh, Love from Ashes is horror, also horror. Love from Ashes is also a, a great, great song. Yeah, and uh, you know, you're the only other human being apart from um, my brother. Michael <laughs> liked it. Michael, <laughs> your brother. Uh, well, there's three. Uh, Michael liked it, but it, it, it was a demo that got mixed up uh, to 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 come up to scratch. Um, as a B-side, as an added track, um, oh, Tom DeLuca. Um, Tommy DeLuca, who actually came up with the um, the phrase uh, Bound for Glory. And he said, I've just got this, because Tom was like that. He he said, you know, I've got this idea for a song. I said, oh, yeah. And I was expecting him to play me a song. And he said, Bound for Glory. I said, uh, he said, when I, it came to me in the car. And he said, like, I just thought of you, Ango. I just thought of you. And, and Tom was one of those real... Uh, consummate um, write by numbers. Uh, he always tried to write, uh, you know, good songs, but, you know, he would sit down and actually methodically write songs, you know, like as in, and he said, it came to me in a flash, bound for glory. I said, well, okay, what's the rest of it? He goes, that's it. <laughs> and I, I looked at Flamer and Flamer looked at me and I said, are you fucking kidding? I said, bound for glory. But then I, then I felt back. So when Mick came in and said, I've got a great idea for a song, Mick Cox, I said, oh, yeah, what is it? And he goes, nice boys don't play rock and roll. I said, oh, yeah, great, play it for me. He said, that's it. <laughs> and I went, oh, that's it. And he went, yeah, that's it. Nice boys don't play rock and roll. And I went, okay. I said, uh, he said, that's just a great title. Um, I'm sure we can do something with it. And I said, well, okay, let me write a lyric around it and then we'll see if we can, you know, like come up with some music. And um, years later, Mick told me the story. When when it was challenged um, by, I don't know, someone out of some Melbourne band, um, it was challenged, Mick was challenged legally having plagiarised the song. And where they made a mistake was that they, the guy that brought the case against it, us, Mick, but us, um, they were, when Mick was in Melbourne, he used to go and stay in this communal house and this guy was there. He was in another band. And uh, this guy was saying, uh, you know, and it, it was like a typical sort of lefty indie Melbourne, you know, hipper than now sort of, you know, like one of those romantically sort of hippie band sure. sort of, you know, of the time. Sure. Um, like a band you wouldn't piss on if they were on fire. But anyway, <laughs> having said that, um, and he it, he was he was having a go at Mick. And um, this is the way Mick told me the story later. And they were in a sort of like a friendly sort of uh, thrust and parry sort of a situation where, and he said, oh, well, you know, fuck, you know, he said, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, well, you know, fuck being, you know, that's not Rose Tatch, you know, fucking, you know, we're fucking bad boys, blah, blah. And, and, and it's, it's, it's disputable, but Mick said, he may have said, you know, well, that's, you know, that's because nice boys don't play rock and roll. 
um, uh, you know, vind- vindicating himself as mm, like a soft mm, cock or mm. whatever. But it, he claims later, the other guy whose name I can't remember, he claims later that he and Mick sat down, which, you know, Mick vehemently, vehemently, vehemently denied. Um, they never sat down and, and I, 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 I mean, choose to believe Mick anyway, but I remember most definitely that they didn't sit down to write a song because when Mick came to me, he said, I've got Nice Boys Don't Play Rock and Roll. Um, it was called Nice Boys. And he said, you know, and the, the tagline is Don't Play Rock and Roll. Um, that's your chorus. And, and that's all he had. He didn't have any music. I went away. I wrote a lyric. I came back to him and I said, I have the song. Da, 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 da. I said, that's, just, that's the chorus, you know. And he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, let's face it, you know, it's just a da 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 There's nothing great, you know, musical, but I mean, it works a tree, you know, mm-hmm. obviously. And Mick put his stamp on it with his, you know, his, his, um, his indelibly stamped rhythm pattern, like style. And then years later, this guy claimed that he co-wrote it, which is, you know, like, oh, I'm sorry, mate. No, you didn't. Never heard that before. It's an interesting one. Interesting. No, I haven't told you that story. <laughs> oh, okay. Mate, Murray Englehart's excellent Blood, Sweat and Beers publication covered a lot of the Tats history, but are there plans to publish a book solely devoted to the band and its history? Um, I, I think uh, uh, you better check this out with Murray, but he, I, I think he wanted to write the book uh, at the time and the publisher thought, and I think it's still true now, because I know that someone approached a publisher. Um, uh, I won't can't mention names, but the, a publisher sort of said, "Look, you know, um, someone came with the idea, like, why isn't there a movie about Rose Tattoo?" And um, this person said, "Who, you know, is very close uh, in." said, um, I don't know, but it'd be a great movie because, you know, like, it would be a great story to tell, you know, about... Lucy Le- produced Le- the movie, didn't she? Lu- Lucy uh, well, movie. She, No, it's, a, it's a Doco. Yeah, Doco. That, that came about... What happened was that Murray... That was talked about years ago, about, you know, doing a Doco. So uh, Lucy, uh, because, you know, her, you know, this long long working association and personal uh, involvement with Pete. She, she'd done film at uni, so she wanted a project, and so she did the, the doco. So, again, you know, Murray, Murray uh, you know, who's always been very, very close to the band, he expressed the interest to, play, to, to, to write the book. Now, the publisher, and, and again, as I say, in recent days, this has happened in like uh, about halfway through last year, as I recall, um, it, it rose its ugly head again. The the publisher doesn't think that there's enough broad appeal um, to 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 write to to support someone to write uh, the definitive book on Rose Tattoo, just Rose Tattoo. So, in the same way that when Murray said, "Well, I want to write a book on Rose Tats," they said it needs to be broader. So he broadened it to. Um, Angels and uh, more, more about yeah, more about the Alberts family, right? In a sense, but also trying to capture and and enlighten the the people who actually were very very instrumental in establishing what we now all have learned to acknowledge and love as um, you know the the great rock pub rock sound like. And, 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 and I, we've talked about this before. Um, the, everyone acknowledges that Lobby Lloyd, his guitar sound, which he searched for over years and finally, you know, like he was one of those people who's never happy. He sort of finally had this monster guitar sound, which everyone copied and made great success. He was never happy. He, he was always looking for the, he was one of those people who always looked for, you know, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Somewhere out there is the ultimate guitar sound. Uh, you know, well, Jesus, you know, like, you know, uh, ACDC, The Angels, Rose Tats, uh, you know, you, there's a long list of guitar bands that took the Lobby Lloyd guitar sound mm. and, you know, made a huge success out of it. But um, 
Yeah, so the, I think I think if anyone ever wants to, um, they'll have difficulty finding a publisher in in, in our experience that will uh, solidly back the project um, and uh, and give and give it you know give it the, uh, the the push that it really really deserves. But the book, I'd be very, I'm very happy that uh, you know I it can't be done without me. So. Uh, you know, permission to use the name, blah, blah, blah. I'm very, very happy about that because it'll either have to be done, like, extremely well, the right way, or fucking leave it alone. I reckon a, a publisher would be surprised. I reckon there is more than enough interest for a definitive history on the band to uh, to see the light well, of day. Well, you, you and I agree on that, but, you know, they they just, you know, yeah, no. Angry. And like I said, only only as recently as as the middle of last year did it raise its head, and the feeling was there was not enough broad appeal. Mate, back in 1995, you did a wonderful duet with Smokey Dawson through the eyes of a child. <laughs> How did that come about? I, I reckon I reckon you've got a country album in you. That's fucking amazing that you. That's uh, I love that album. There's two. Albums that, you know, A, didn't see the light of day. Uh, one I did with, um, oh, I can't remember his name, he's an American bloke, um, and one of the, 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 the producer, uh, one of the Tapano uh, family, and I did a, a track on a Christmas album with Smokey Dawson, Christmas Day Australia Way. Um, and I, I'd met Mr. Smokey um, many, many years uh, uh, earlier on Midday. And, you know, it was gushingly sort of like, you know, the the gushing, blushing fan, you know, about how much of a – because I grew up with his music, you know. my I got my, taken uh, out to his friend. ranch as a kid. We went to his ranch. There you go. Um, Mr. You know, Mr. Smokey, as I used to call him, but mm. I used to call uh, – uh, um, Slim Dusty, Mr. Dusty as well, which he thought was hilarious. But um, so I, I knew Smokey Dawson and, and, and I met his lovely wife and um, you know, the, there was a, 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 a real affection there. So he comes to do his, his duet album and um, you know, the, whoever produced it rang me up and said, Smokey wants you to be um, on his, he wants to sing a duet. And, um, you know, he wants you to pick a song. And um, so I went, well, you know, I've I've, I've only got maybe two or three really, apart from Patsy, um, maybe a couple of others. um, Oh, well, I mean, you know, um, there's the Highwaymen, um, whom I love to bits. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, there's not too many people in the country genre, the country music sort of that I like or love. Um, so, you know, I picked that song, I mean, because I always loved it. I remembered it as a kid. It was a childhood song, childhood memory. So I picked that and I was going to sing it in the high register because um, I, I heard that I heard the track and I thought, well, I can sing it up there, you know, in the high register I, and, you know, it'll sound you know, a bit Rod Stewarty sort of, you know, gravelly, a bit gravelly and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I'd be really happy with that. So um, I'm just trying to think of who produced it. It wasn't Garth Porter, was it? No. Um, anyway, I turn up to the session and um, I, I, this, I was set up. This is the story. It's so fucking lovely, a really lovely story. So they say, right, I sing it through and I sang it through in a higher register and – the producer said, you got to mind being Herm Kodak, was it? Anyway, so I, he said, look, can you try it in the lower register? And I said, yeah, yeah, I can. He said, no, I really, really want to hear that sort of, you know, that really sort of laid back, you know, not, not, ah, but, uh, you know, croon. So I said, yeah, okay. So I did, you know. And, Anyway, the backstory, and I heard this story later, which is a great story. Um, Smokey always liked to sing in that nasally higher register, which was quite natural to him. Um, it's where he used to sing, right? So 
he he said to um, let's call it Herm, who was doing it. He said, get him to sing in the lower register because um, I'll want the high road or the high part, um, and I'll sing. Oh, you know, I'll sing my. So when I went in there, I was hoping that there was already going to be a a Smokey Dawson vocal on it. Mm. I can use it as a guide. And he said, no, there isn't, but you sing it, you know, like try and stick to the phrasing as much as you can, but make it your own, you know, the whole thing, the sort of thing that producers say to a singer. And uh, I felt very comfortable in doing it both ways. <laughs> little did I know that Smokey had said, get him to sing it in the lower register and I'll take the high part. So that's how it turned out that way. It's, but, a, it's uh, a wonderful very, very tune. Happy. It's a wonderful tune. And uh... I, I was just thrilled a bit to be on an album with him. Yesterday we spoke about the faces. They toured Australia February 74. You attended Melbourne? Uh, I don't remember actually the night, but I know that I went and saw a performance. Okay. Encore with Pool Hall Richard. Love to hear you do Pool Hall Richard. Oh, okay. You're full of surprises. <laughs> really? You really are. Um, I, I... I, have a, I have a bootleg of it somewhere, and I know that they encore in Sydney with Pool Hall Richard. It's just great. These are, these are tracks, because you mentioned Rod yesterday, I thought some of these would suit your your phrasing. Mate, I, I remember when I did, um, what was that show, you know, where they had duets? It was a panel show that was shot at the ESPY. Um, rock, rock Quiz, is that it? Rock Quiz, yeah, Rock Quiz. Um, you know, I did it a couple of times, and once I did it with Sarah quite predictably, Sarah... Um, McLeod. And we did, yeah, we did, we did Highway to Hell. Mm. And then I did it with Megan Washington and we did, I picked Ooh La La and we did a duet on Ooh La La and it was fucking great. We actually talked about with the orchestra, because uh, James Black, I've been a huge fan of James, uh, you know, ever since the first time I ever heard him play. And um, got to know him a little bit through um, Paul Christie because of his work with the Mondos. But um, mm. a big, big fan of of, um, of James. And um, he thought that we should do a, a – we jammed a few things like Cut Across Shorty and, um, you know, uh, a few of the, the soul things, you know, Reason to Believe and uh, Mandolin Wind and a few things like that. And and we thought that it sounded good enough that we, of course, you know, this is this is always happens, never eventuates to anything. But hey, why don't we do a Roddy Stewart show or a set uh, of Roddy Stewart? Maybe some Otis Redding, maybe some sort of Sam Cooke, maybe, and and take it on the road, like do it as a band, like. Um, and we talked about it, but uh, never eventuated, yeah. obviously. Mate, I am uh, going to finish up and I'll let you get out of here. Lots of touring activity within the Rose Tattoo Camp right through two thousand and nineteen. Projects, you know, one product which I think would prove incredibly popular, lots of bands do it, is a line of rose tattoo beer. <laughs> Funny you should say that. Um, I, I was down in South Australia, um, it was either last year or the year before, and I went to visit a brewery. We were trying to get sponsors to do a, a, a cable show on the history, and, and, and not just the history, but a very, very seriously thought out, non-sensationalised uh, TV show on tattooing. And there was a brewery down there, and I'm still in contact with them, and they said, we'd love to do a couple of lines of beer, um, and one would be called uh, a Bad Boy for Love or, bad, you know, blah, blah, obviously. And I said, well, yeah, I'd, I'd put the names of that if it was a good beer. Mm. Anyway, they gave me a taste of a, a boutique a little brewery and went out there for lunch. Suffice to say, left there just legless. Um, they made really, really, really good beer. And that's a great idea. And uh, it's worth pursuing. At the moment, um, and, and it's not related to Rose Tats, but because um, I've drank Stones on Stones Green Ginger Wine for years on stage, um, they used to sponsor me uh, and blood, sweat, and beers for show. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, so I don't know how, how that would sit well with them, but we they aren't sponsoring us officially as the chat. So um, yeah, I mean, like I said, um, the same brewery that we're interested in in doing a, a or um, they had another idea 
you know, like like obviously an angry lager or angry bitter or something, you know, like uh, like design a beer around by name. And they did ask me. They said, "Well, you know, what's the chance of the roast?" But at that time, there was, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, uh, you know, a going thing. The tap thing wasn't going thing. So if it happens, it happens. And I guess people will check out roasttattoo.com.au for uh, for news on that, mate. Thank you for taking your time to chat with us today. The rock and roll which you've helped to create has been the soundtrack and a constant in the lives of so many of us. It's provided us with much enjoyment and continues to do so. So thanks again. Well, thanks, brother. And let's just uh, take uh, a little bit of um, positivity. It's not over yet. Every guest on our show gets to choose a song by an Australian band. What would you like to choose and why? Healing Force. Lovely. Um, Golden Miles, is it? Golden Miles, Healing Force, one of the great vocals of all time. Thanks, mate. Much appreciated. It's been, no uh, it's been gr- great having you on, and I'll be in touch. Thank you. No whackers, mate. Thanks, Anytime. mate. Bye-bye.